Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. And welcome to Around the World in 80 Drinks with us, the Thinking Drinkers. This is a podcast that celebrates discerning drinking all over the planet. And welcome to this, the last episode in our mini series, uh, which is all about rum, a rum mini series. And in it, we're going to be tasting the excellent Venezuelan rums of Diplomatico. There's a picture of Diplomatico. So thank you for choosing our pod. Uh, we're going to do a lovely rum tasting today. If you're new to our pod, thank you for choosing it. And we are the Thinking Drinkers. My name is Tom Sandham. This is Ben McFarland. Hello, Ben. Hello, Tom. How are you? I'm okay. Yes, we're recording this uh, for the purposes of dates and dating this yep. podcast uh, as the, the Americans choose their president. So it's been quite an exciting week. Lots of good yep. TV uh, while I've been drinking, and I've been drinking some exceptional gear this week, Ben. I don't what have you been mind telling you. Well, I did a tasting with um, the Hein Cognac Distillery. Uh, over the French, we're doing everything via Zoom now. We are again in the middle of a lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, but I was meant to go to Hein, to the distillery in April, and couldn't go for obvious reasons. And uh, they released their, uh, their vintages, was it called the Bonnet Vintages? And they sent me four of these bottles. Did they? Um, why didn't they send me some? Oh, well, you weren't invited. Peasants. This was posh gear. And uh, so they uh, every year they they look at what's in the barrels and they create a vintage that's based on the the grapes of that particular year. And if they've had a good good yield and they've had good grapes for their brandies, they they create a, a vintage based on that so it's not every year uh we had the 2006 and we had this year's um and there were four and they all tasted very different it was a very interesting experience and in fact there was a wine writer in the tasting on the zoom chat room who was talking about why they hadn't got a vintage every year and um mm -hmm. because one of the years i think it was 2007 or 8 was a great year for the for the vines but there wasn't a, a cognac and he in the, the they, they right. explained it's because they need wine, the grapes with high acidity. That's what makes good cognac. And right. um, and if the wine is great, if the grape is great for wine, it's not necessarily great for for spirit. Oh, for de vie. So they take the high acidity wines that probably don't taste so nice fermented, but once they fermented them, they distill them, and that's what's good about them. Hein is is a is a great distillery. We will get out there. We will. You will come with me, Ben. You will be invited. I'll come. I'll carry your notepad or whatever you do to take it. I'll, I'll take I, it maybe I could do the old. Uh, you could do the old. I'll have to buy one of those old cameras. So it's like, <laughs> oh, who's the fat lad? Oh, he's the one with. The, he's a mum photographer. Yeah. Um, You're doing it on a an old yeah. point yeah, tube. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so yeah. well. So what was it? It was a good. It was a good harvest this year. Was it hot during the? Uh, during a day and cold and overnight. Uh, I, I, but I would, what I would say about uh, yeah. the whole wine carry on in the world of cognac is it does seem to be slightly more complex than, say, the wine industry, oh, which, right. uh, <laughs> which does seem to just be based I mean, on hot yeah. summers, cold yeah. nights, Winters warm days. Goes well with pasta. That uh, kind of stuff. Yeah, tastes of wine yeah. and that sort of thing. Uh, but it, it was interesting having a wine writer on there because his perspective was slightly different. But but he had questions that obviously I had because I am also uh, a wine expert like you. We've established yep. our credentials in yep. that in that world, which probably I've brings us on to. I've got a cravat. Have you? Have you? Um, because the other thing I've been tasting, which I know you've been tasting, yeah. is these. these bad boys. Well, I know, I know. It looks like. Well, we we've had these at our desk, so we decided to talk about them. Yes, I've been. Um, so I should Drinking. say, so just quickly that we we now video our podcasts. Oh yes, um, yes, yes. So we are holding up Bib Wine Company pouches. Yes, that, uh, were kindly sent to us uh, around the time Ben, particularly Ben, you you took the lead on yeah. the, the right. No, so right, so let, let me give you the background here. Uh, Bibwine.co.uk, uh, a bunch of wine buffs that were supposed to open a bar, a wine bar. Um, when COVID hit, um, but like all good businesses, yeah, they are uh, pivoted, okay, and uh, changed direction and just roll with the punches. And they started producing these um, wine packs because obviously they had a lot of wine. Um, and these wine uh, these wine packs consist of six 100 milliliter pouches, so they're a bit like a sort of wine version of the Kellogg's variety packs with your Rice Krispies, your corn flakes, and if you're being a really good boy. Cocoa Pops. Cocoa Pops. Chocolate yeah. for breakfast. Chocolate yeah. for breakfast. We're going to get on to chocolate. Yeah. 
I'd rather have a bowl of cocoa pops. So oh, yeah. yes. Dun, 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 so dun, they're dun. Um, but they're now people might scoff at having wine in one of these, but um, le botte. No, but they're no, not your body. Not, not your body. Um, <laughs> uh, strange that tangent there, Tom. Uh, anyway, they're great. Um, they, they're good because there's 100 milliliters in there and have lots of different wines. So you can taste, uh, you can get a sample of some wonderful wines that probably cost quite a lot in the, in the bottle. And you can expand your wine horizons, guys, at home. Um, and they do these limited editions every month. And they do a Zoom tasting. And um, during lockdown, they proved to be very popular. Yeah. Um, now, my favourite one is this li- this one here. Which one have you got? Because this is interesting. I've kept my favourite pouch. Did you go, by any chance, this is all mm. listeners, this is exciting, isn't it? We're going to yes. reveal here. Uh, right. Did you go for the um, the Domaine Jean-Marc Astruc? I did. Did you? Jean, That's what yes. I went for. <laughs> well, you're very... Oh. Well, because... So this is from the Fitu region, Fitu mm. wine making wine making region in southwest France. Right? It's an appellation protégé. Appellation, oui, 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 oui. oui. Mm. And um, he uh, he's called Jean Marc Astruc. He's a he's a French person, <gasps> and he has oui. uh, his wife is Katie Jones, mm. who's been making he's been down and making amazing kind of adventurous small batch wines down there for twenty years. And I've actually been there back in two thousand and four. When mm. I started writing writing about wine, <laughs> I went down there and visited uh, and wrote about it in uh, for French magazine and loads of different magazines. It was right at the beginning of my freelance career. Drank loads of white wine, mucked about on a quad bikes, belled mm. around the Languedoc region, which is beautiful, and ate wild boar. Wild boar. Wild boar. Um, da, 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 da. Wild boar. Wild, wild boar. Wild boar. Um, and so back in August, we were uh, the Telegraph got us to write about wine as they do because they're always always asking us to write about wine. And we're like, look, guys, we're, we're wine experts writers. in other fields. Mm. Just try and work, use some wine writers. But they were like, no, man, we want you because you are the new the new, new gen world, the, the new, new generation. Gen. You're the new force in wine writing. And I was like, okay, guys, give the people what they want. And so. I, Wait, I mean, we gra- should say to, to anyone who's listening now, still, if you're still listening, yeah. um, we are actually on the the, uh, the um, panel for cool brands. So yeah, yeah, uh, man, yeah we are. I think they recognise that we're just cool guys who know yeah. all about wine as well. Cool, cool exactly. Mm. So um, and we did a, what was, can only be described as a groundbreaking piece in the Telegraph, all about uh, wine in pouches and boxes and ba- bag in a box and. What is known, one one very clever uh, group of people uh, have, have have called it Bagnums, so yeah. they've kind of trademarked that. But anyway, one of the wines I wrote about was this. Yeah. And when I tasted this again, I don't mind telling you, Tom. It's just It magical. was just as good as I remember. Magical um, stuff. And I got it? a very early exclusive tasting of this, and I've tasted it again, and it's, and it's just amazing. It's a deep <laughs> ruby wild and herby syrah driven red and it goes well with uh toulouse sausages i'd have it with maybe maybe a leg of lamb yeah Yeah, or or if you're being really exotic and you want to be true to its uh its its provenance you'd have it with wild boar wild boar wild boar um so yes i suggest you go and um have and go to bibwine.co.uk yeah. and get involved because right. they're really nice and they come in these cool little packages. It's all very environmentally friendly. Yeah. It's nice. It doesn't oxidise and stuff like that. And they're doing it, they've done it really well. Do that. Um, and go on to the people... whiskey exchange and buy some of the Hein cognac as well if you like cognac. Yeah. Great, for great Christmas Christmas treat as we approach uh, the Christmas of our year. Uh, but the wine thing was interesting, wasn't it? Because <laughs> it was, um, Tom. Yeah. They, they can be a sensitive bunch, the old wine writers, can't they? And uh, Ben thought it, it was a kind of a, a flippant remark. He he well, he put this out there and said, hashtag wine writing is well easy. Well yeah. easy. For anyone who knows playground parlance, when you said something like that, like, I'm well skilled, uh, yeah. which we said all the time as kids, oh, I'm well are, good at football, um, or yeah. you are well rubs. Things like that. Well, is a sort of pay, playground parlance which we wouldn't really use. Well, I mean, our, if it was in our 
serious vernacular or no. yeah so rhyme writing is well easy it was clearly a bit of a bit of a joke wasn't it ben well i um i would say it was uh it was born out of i suppose years of wine writers uh writing about beer which is i mm. consider mine and spirits. not exclusive domain because how could you exclusively own the uh the whole world of writing about a subject people are right free to write about it how and they, they want and, and beer really is a piece of piss as well it's it? fine <laughs> jesus christ I and mean, that really <laughs> is easy beer writer my of the year three, three times year. ben beer of the year. Year, so. flat trap bully tom <laughs> um tallest dwarf competition etc etc et anyway small, tallest small person then oh yeah sorry someone mm. now i think you can call them dwarves i don't think so but anyway what doesn't matter? Anyway, Let's move on. anyway uh, it's the same with spirits. Uh, wine writers often write about spirits, write about beer. Uh, we wish we would have, uh, uh, you know, they they go to actual experts, but that's fine. That's <laughs> that's the way it goes. So when we uh, wrote a very small piece in the Telegraph about wine, what, uh, one person in particular got rather, I think their 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 their, their wine sniffing nose was put out of a joint and they started sniping at us on it that. really i think it's fair to say Twitter. rang the end of his bell didn't yeah it, it really <laughs> did. He, it turned out to be a complete bell end uh, yeah so he started he started uh having a go at us on instagram and twitter and just um but in a very sort of weird way. But anyway, we ignored him because we didn't know who he was. I had no idea who this uh, man was. No, I don't know. And obviously, uh, we're, um, I know we don't look like we're busy people, but we've certainly got better things to do than get involved in some futile exercise on on the internet about yeah on, on the social media i would just point p- p- interject here with the with the fact that i know we're going to use social media to promote this podcast and it does yeah. have its values but yeah. uh, t- t- twitter spats are for donald trump and by association children yes get a f- flipping grip people. i mean you might as well throw to choose off. fucking clouds because it it's is so no weird. one has ever they're futile no one has ever gone actually you made a good point i'm going to back off here <laughs> so uh we ignored it and like yeah. a lot of the problems we uh, come across if you ignore them they do go away mm. um, it's it's weird though um just sort of stopped stopped doing things and then it became clear why it gone quiet because apparently in the meantime uh, and apparently this guy's a big deal in wine. He'd sent a load of WhatsApp messages to others in the wine sort of Twitter bubble, the wine world, of which we're not part of, mm. obviously, um, which were really, really not very nice. And when I say not very nice, they were highly offensive. Um, we've not seen them, but according to an article on Tim Atkins' uh, blog... Who's a nice chap. Who's a, who's a very big guy, part mm. guy in wine... Um, and it was written. Uh, it was written on there, not by him, by someone else. Uh, she was. She, it was a wonderful piece. Um, according to her, who has read them, uh, they were vicious, personal, and cruel. The anger, the anger that came off the page was palpable and toxic, with crude and angry sentences tripping over too many long words. And apparently, <laughs> well, he can't. I mean, I, <laughs> let's put the guns down. <laughs> He didn't use alliteration a lot, did he? Yeah. <laughs> and open, no, and open features. His intros, did he? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and open podcasts on rum tastings with spurious, <laughs> elongated sidesteps about Anyway, <laughs> anyway, to cut, look, we're, uh, we're giving this far too much oxygen. But anyway, it's quite... We, we, so we've got... They were apparently misogynistic. They were aimed at young mm. women in the wine trade. Um, it was apparently really awful stuff. Uh, and we, we were completely oblivious to this until uh, um, it turns out that we were, we, we we were, were part of it. He was slagging we us off. He was <laughs> the whole of the wide world. Um, and we had no idea because we don't get involved in that. Um, and the only reason we know that is because he sent us out of the blue a groveling apology via email. And this is after he sent out loads of, his lawyer sent out loads of cease and desist letters from people who were exposing these messages, which were spoke, were aimed at um, other people. They were supposed to be private messages, but they were so toxic, apparently, that people thought, well, I should really tell. Come clean, I'm not showing these. Anyway, 
Um, he's going through a hard time. Apparently, he's having a hard time during lockdown. Bless him. I think he needs a cuddle. I think we probably all are. And yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. There's no real reason to <laughs> dig really... out people who really couldn't give a monkey's about who you are. I mean, we'd, we'd name this man because we we have been told his name, but we yeah. didn't know who he was. And frankly, I, I doubt anyone who's listening really knows who he is. So best just to not give him any more yeah. publicity. Well, but if you do um, want to just check out, because uh, it's. It is, what is laid bare is the, uh, the 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 widespread misogyny and the power of the patri- patriarchy within the wine world, and mm-hmm. this idea that it's um, it's a rather male dominant white male posh dominated world has has been rubber stamped by the, the this guy's um, ranting. So um, go to uh, click on hashtag wine bitch yeah <laughs> on Twitter and search for it. And you'll see that it's been quite the storm. Well, and although he tried to rubber stamp it, just, I think one one of the things that was really interesting was the number of people who who uh, came out in disgust and the and the diversity of some of the voices coming through that mm. channel. So there is a bit. There's much more diversity in wine and uh, and just like spirits and beer, it's it's just a case of not letting the voices that that trample on that have a have a have a platform so it seems yeah. like it's, it's being corrected and if you yeah, if you go on hashtag hashtag and what wine, was it what was what was it wine, is it hashtag um, wine dick or wine no uh, wine bell is it wine hashtag Bellend. wine, it was, wine prick? Was what's his name massive <laughs> cork sniffing bell end um <laughs> no uh it's <laughs> hashtag wine bitch mm. and also because that was that was the uh the nom de plume of his his WhatsApp uh, messages. Um, I mean, yeah, it's pretty bad. It was anyway, pretty bad. So um, we said our piece. Yeah. Couldn't, the fact is, the more we say about it, the more it looks like we care. We really don't. Um, no, I did one thing. I did. I did uh, take umbrage. Uh, sorry, just because we haven't seen what he wrote about us, um, and we have no. I, I'm not bothered about seeing it. But what I am bothered about is during his apology, he apologised for punching down. Mm. which I thought was pretty fucking ballsy. Oh, wait a minute. Wait buddy. a minute. <laughs> Level yeah. with you. Yeah. Don't know who you are. And no. did you know that I'm the IWSC Spirits Communicator of the Year? So I think Well, that's a, funny enough. He actually, I think he won that award on the wine side. Um, so who's he punching down at? Yeah. Um, and no. well, if he's punching down there, down then, I don't think he's punching down anymore because he's been shunned. Yeah. Um, anyway. Uh, we when we, if we ever meet him, I'll rather than kick his face in. Uh, I think we're just going to give him a cuddle because it sounds like he needs one. Um, one anyway. day, one day when this when this podcast is uh, hugely popular, more popular than it is now, thousands of downloads. Thanks, guys. But you know, when it gets to the twenties and thirties and fifty thousands of downloads, yeah. um, then we will bring back Sam Caporn because although we are wine experts, it would help to have Sam Caporn, uh, the mistress of wine, yeah. back in the room to help she's us. The pro- uh, she's, she's the real deal. She's yeah, real yeah, deal. yeah, yeah. She's the uh, she's the wind beneath our wine wings. Indeed. But anyway. Wow. We're not talking about wine today. We're talking about Diplomatico, which is why yes. there's a picture of Diplomatico behind us. Well, more specifically, we're talking about rum, and it's the last in our rum mini series. Uh, and what we wanted to do in this final episode is talk a bit more about neat rum. We talked about cocktails and all the rest of it uh, in the in the previous the history, but today we're going to focus on rum and pairing it with some food. Mm. Specifically, we are going to pair it with chocolate. Now, Ben and I have done a lot of food and drink pairings over our our time. There have been trends. Brands have tried to really jump on a bandwagon of food and drinks pairings. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It, from my perspective, we've done a lot of spirits and food pairings and it can be a bit tricky. We did mm. a really successful food pairing with Jamie Oliver uh, when we were writing for his magazine and working on his uh, uh, drinks Ooh, tube site. Tom, how's it, Tom? How did you pick up that name you just dropped? Uh, yeah. Kalein. Jamie yeah, Jamie. Hi, James. Hi, uh, Anyway, Good so mind. Jamie Oliver asked uh, for, a, for a bit of a pairing with, with spirits and food. And in that, there were pairings uh, mm-hmm. like gin and duck, because we worked with uh, juniper gravy. We also oh. sort of vodka with sats, raw fish. Not Schlegel. unusual. The Schlegel. Russians Schlegel. do things like that. You can do it with smoked salmon. You can do aquavit. Yeah. Like. Um, so there are ways to carry spirits from a martini intro through to uh, vodka and gins in fishy dishes or 
uh, big hearty whiskies or old fashions that could go with nice meaty dishes. It can work. But the reality is what we've always said, you don't need to do a spirits and food matching. You don't need to do a wine and food or indeed a beer and food, which you can come on to, Ben, because you, mm. you should you should be eclectic in your choice you should go from something yeah. like maybe a beer starter with your nuts to a uh, wine with your main and maybe yeah. a spirits with dessert and really for me yeah. that's where spirits come into their own when it comes to things like whiskey with cheese or yeah. rum with chocolate but the same rules apply with beer don't they ben? well yes there was um when i first started writing about beer way back when tom way back when um uh, beer and food was becoming a, a big thing. Beer and food pairing. Obviously, if you go back centuries ago, people would have drank beer with food, but that was out of necessity rather than choice. Um, and um, I think beer looked at the wine world and thought, well, they're stealing a march in us. There, it's always and beer used to be the thing that would be on the din, dining tables of, of, of everyone in Britain. But then, then wine came in and, and usurped it. Um, and beer wanted to become a bit more like wine and wanted the you know make itself look a bit more sophisticated and the best way of doing that is to make it compatible with food with cuisine and so there's been a big push across all all styles of beer at all levels of um big push to promote beer as an accompaniment to food and i think there's a lot of um a lot of truth in it there are beer has a huge spectrum of flavors and aromas that that go very well with with food um uh, I'd say potentially more than wine, um, but I'm yet to be convinced that, I'm, I'm, that a, a four or five course meal with a different beer with each each dish, I'm yet to be convinced that that really works because mm. I'll be honest, the carbonation for me becomes too much of a factor. Um, and I don't think it will ever take off massively mainly because in restaurants and pubs that are serving beer with food they're less likely to promote it because the sheer margins on wine mean that they're missing out on some some big profits um and then and that's before you've even got over the hurdle of changing people's perceptions but where i think beer and food pairing really does work is a bit like the spirits um i think you need to pick your battles mm. i think as a starter like an aperitif if you have a nice fruit lambic beer in a champagne flute before a meal um that instead of a, a say a glass of white wine or a or a champagne or a prosecco that is that's brilliant because that is it's it's totally it's a very easy way of convincing people that beer can be just as complex and sophisticated and as aromas as, as wine and then at the end of the meal you can have beer with cheese that really does go mm. well with, mm. with beer goes well with cheese um you have vintage ales which are like ports um it goes beer and chocolate goes very well so there's lots i mean there's um, i just think that this idea that someone's going to be drinking the uh, beer all the way through a meal is it's a good one to prove the point but yeah i've never done it at home no. uh, i like my wine too much mm. as as well we know and i'm quite the expert on it so mm. um uh i i like i think beer and food is something that people should explore and it's a bit cheaper as well and one one of the beer and food pairings i've been doing this week tom because it was halloween like well last week i've been eating bugs yeah it's hobgoblin beer do you know hobgoblin beers they're i do of course which yeah. huge they're a bit of a classic real ale been around for ages they've they they've kind of repositioned themselves as a halloween beer unofficial of course um uh, and they do a really decent IPA and they've got a lovely ruby beer, a really good imperial ruby beer. But they sent me some crickets and grasshoppers and sort of um, bug protein stuff. I'll get it. Uh, what was it? Uh, cricket protein. And you put it in like um, stir fries and stuff and grasshoppers. And yeah, it's quite a traditional addition yeah, yeah, yeah. to South Asian anyway, cuisine. They're very nice. I'm going to eat them now. Uh, I'm going to eat it very close to the mic so you can hear the crunch. They are They, they are crickets. I mean, they are, That's and they're these ones are the smoky. <laughs> it's not cricket. They're, no, it is cricket. Oh, these yeah. are smoky barbecue. Mm. Pick it out. Yeah, I can hear crunch. Bugs. Bit like the, the the sound of those chipper crickets in the summer yeah. evening. And yeah, you're well, just if they're going to keep me them. awake, I'm if you're a vegan, we apologise. 
No, uh, they're bugs. But this is... I've eaten a lot of bugs, actually, on summer evenings on my bike. And weirdly, mm. yesterday I went out, and we're now in November, and it mm. was a, there were swarms of little midges everywhere. Very, not very tasty. No. Um, not a great pairing with beer, I'd imagine, when you're on no, a bike. No, but these are a good pairing with beer. I'm good. Just okay. With IPA. Hmm. But um, more, more pertinently... More importantly, I suppose. Rum and chocolate? These... No, no, no. <laughs> Very quickly, insects are going to be the next big thing. They're they're high in fibre, high in protein, low in carbs, low in sugar, and they're low in carbon footprint. They're very sustainable. They use very little water uh, or food, and uh, you don't have to, well, compared to cows and that, hmm. uh, you don't have to be, have massive fields. And remember when we were in Oaxaca doing yeah. our mezcal exploration, we met that woman in a restaurant from the UN who was doing a PhD in grasshoppers. Yeah. Um, what a type of student. Anyway, she reckoned they were going to save the planet and end third world poverty. And um, by the end of talking, by the end of talking to her, I was convinced. Um, and they're very nice. Good. And they're, I'm not eating carbs at the moment. So and they're full of protein and they're like crisps. So there you go. I'll tell you what I did. I did. A, it's I, I baked up my pumpkin seeds rather than uh, just chuck them in the bin. I, uh, I coated them in um, olive oil and then paprika, really? uh, chili, good. and salt and pepper, and baked them in the oven. And I'm eating them. And I tell you what, they, oh, they, I, I, they, the you following really? day, <laughs> I, really? I had quite the evacuation at the were toilet you pumping, station. You pumping all day? Pumping. It was just, it was just, it, yeah, it floods right through you. I, they're very good. They're very good if you've got any bit of a sort of blockages any blockages pumpkin seeds a bit like halloween bats out of a clock tower yeah Ooh, scary something was scaring the shit right out of me it was pumpkin <laughs> seeds not the not the scary faces the seeds anyway yes. so that's our uh, our food and drink wider yeah. perspective on things but yes we are today specifically talking about venezuelan rum in the form of diplomatico why are we talking about diplomatico uh well they wanted to work with us they heard, heard yeah. our podcast knew that people were listening and we said we wanted to talk about rum. So they suggested that they work with us on rum. And we wanted to do this mini series. And they've got loads of different rums being made at the, the distillery. So it has provided us with all the stuff we've been talking about in the, the three series. And particularly, I would say, sipping rums. We've yes. been using Diplomatico rums in our uh, critically acclaimed theatrical performances our yeah. tastings we use it because it does change people's perceptions on rum it's a very sweet rich chocolatey rum people who think they don't like rum or only have rum and coke they have something like a diplomatico reserva exclusiva and we find it completely changes their perceptions and sort of sets them on the path to discovering lots of interesting and complex rums they use lots of different te te techniques at diplomatico so we've talked about this before but they're kettle pots pot stills column stills they use lots of different maturation processes in different woods they use molasses which is refined sugar they use sugarcane honey so the rums are ideal for us when we come to talking about mm. the category as a whole um, now we've got the diplomatico uh reserva exclusiva here today we've got uh, their Mantuana, and we've got the new one, which is Selection de Selection Selection de la Famille. De Famille. If you nice watch Narcos, <clears throat> you watch some cartel films and series on Netflix, you can perfect the accent. Famille. Selection de Famille. Uh, they're all cultivated uh, in the surroundings of the Venezuelan city of La Miel. Uh, which yeah. is in the heart of the Terrapima National Park. Why that's important is because they've got quite a unique climate around there, sort of really rich soils there at the bottom of the foot of the Andes. So they've got quite unique climate conditions. And with all this, all these different techniques they use to make their rum and mature it, uh, there's plenty of variety going on there. And they've also got two rum masters, uh, Tito Cordera and Nelson Hernandez. Uh, so they've got two of these guys who really know their business. So that's why we're using them, isn't it, Ben? It certainly is. Now, yeah. it's all about aged rums. Now, most people, the vast majority of rum, I'm right in thinking, Tom, is consumed in the world is probably light, clear rum, uh, often uh, drowned in Coca-Cola or other mixes. And most people don't probably think that it's just can it can be just as complex as a cognac or sophisticated as a single more whiskey but this is all about the aged rum sipping rums and as you can see i don't know if you can see this on the camera but um for people just an audio visual an audio format rather i'm holding it up and it's a lovely golden amber color 
the rum's colour is a direct direct result of ageing in oak casks. And uh, most commonly, they're American oak casks, which have previously been used to mature American whiskey or, or bourbon. Now, this type of oak is very rich in vanillins, which gives the rum its vanilla aroma. So I smelled it there to yeah. really hammer home the idea that it's an aroma. And then rum ages quicker in this in the Venezuelan climate uh, because um, uh, than it does in, say, Scotland, where it's a much, much chillier. Because in the tropics, when tropical aging, sorry, I've got cricket in my mouth. Hang on, let me just take a look. Wait a minute. <laughs> Come back, he'll do repeat the on you, jumping yeah. up your throat. <laughs> Jumped out. Um, uh, so that in, in that heat, because the, the, the differentiation with the heat during the, in, in the evening and during the day, it means the wood expands, opens, and closes uh, to, to a much wider degree, and that lets in uh, uh, the, the, the rum to soak deep into the wood. Um, there, therefore it has more interaction with the wood, therefore more colour, and then it picks up more with the vanilla in, influence. Now the Diplomatico rums are mostly rested in these um, uh, former bourbon and, and, and malt whiskey barrels, but they also, uh, they experiment with different different woods, different oak, uh, and they, they use Sherry Oak, Pedro, Pedro Jimenez, and Oloroso Sherry cast as well to finish. So they, uh, right at the end of the aging process, they'll finish them in single vintage, and uh, uh, in, the, in these sherry casts to, to produce their single vintage and ambassador rums, which are, again, another step up. Yeah, so they've got a range. They, they are designed for sipping, very much so. I mean, they're obviously very versatile. You can you can put them in, put Coca-Cola with them if you want. You, uh, you can. And they make a nice rum and coke, but we suggest it's probably a waste. No, I mean, having said that, we've got the Mantuana, uh, which we'll taste first with our chocolate selection, which yes. we'll get onto. We're going to drink it neat. We think it can be drunk neat. It's a, it's a lovely rum, but it's also designed to be used in, in cocktails as well. So you can you can use these rums in cocktails, and we've talked about the Diplomatico Reserva Exclusiva old-fashioned. So you can use them for mixing, um, but the good thing is that they are something you can... Um, at neat and just a quick overview of the three rums we've got Ben the Mantuana that's a blend of column distilled rum so lighter spirit and then they've used rum from their batch kettle and pot stills um, it's made from molasses and sugarcane honey and that one will be aged for up to eight years so that's the the, yep. the first one in our tasting then we're going up to the Diplomatica Reserva Exclusiva which is the one we know very well because it's the one we always sample in our show people love it it's rich, it's sweet, it's a great sipping rum. It's like catnip amongst the crowds, isn't it? People it really love is. it. Mm. All ages, uh, over 18, obviously. Uh, it's amazing stuff. My my wife's grandma, who is Polish, she's 94. I think she might be 95, actually. And apparently she took, I gave her some miniatures of this because she loves it so much. She took it kayaking a few weeks ago. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's, um, it's, uh, it's really good. It's, it's lovely stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then finally, we're going to do we're going to do three today. And we've got the uh, Selection de Famille, Famille, uh, from the Famille. Famille. Um, which is, is if you have already been listening to us and you've already got involved in your world of Diplomatic Air Reserve Exclusiva through our shows, this is kind of this next step, really. Uh, so this is uh, 12 years in a combination of American white oak and ex-bourbon and ex-sherry casks. So it's a bit more complex. Uh, it's got some uh, drier notes in there, some the Oloroso sherry barrels of give it a bit of a, a different finish. So there's more, maybe more raisins in there. Uh, it's it's very complex. Uh, so it's a nice sort of transition um, up to the next level. You can see they've, they've, they've only just launched that, but they are all available on the Whiskey Exchange. So if you now get to the point where you'd like to be involved in tasting these as we go, now's the time to press pause, go onto the whiskeyexchange.com and order all three. Frankly, or alternatively, listen now and then get on a different computer or device and download the thing again, which means we get two hits and do it with the rum. Yeah, I mean, we don't. I don't have any uh, of the vintage, uh, uh, the Diplomatico vintage. They do mm. some vintages as well. Um, we did. I did have some two thousand and five, which was sent in a fantastic tasting that I did with these guys. But as you can see, I have, I finished it. 
And um, then there's the ambassador as well, Diplomatico ambassador. So once you get into this, the top end um, ambassador is uh, Pedro Jimenez Sherry Casks, and it's a bit more like a port. And that will set you back a couple of hundred quid. So that's where you get into. It, there's a real journey to be had, isn't there, Tom? There is. I feel like we've got um, a journey. We wouldn't really be talking about them if we didn't really like them. So uh, no, no, no. We could no. have done. We uh, lots of people have talked to us about being on our show. Um, we did do a guys. kebab book with WKD, but that was back. That when was we, when we really, we really, the really money. desperate. We did need the money. <laughs> yeah, that's where someone in the world wide in the wide world could legitimately have punched down. Yeah, I don't know. Not anyone in the kebab world. I mean, we no, really, no, no. We, we, we really we did were, our homework on that. We were top don donners in that world. Uh, um, so we chocolate. have been pairing, pairing them with chocolates. chocolates. That's what, what chocolate? you need to do. That's what right. you should be doing. We're getting to Christmas. Uh, people talk about uh, something like a Bailey's after their dinner. That seems to be a standard. At Christmas sales go through the yeah. roof. Uh, there's a, there's a like pirate a, pun in there. Yeah. Um, and so, but we are we are advising you to uh, improve your liquid lives. Get a bit more discerning in your drinking. Get chocolate with your rum. This yeah. is a pairing. You do it after dinner. They sit down to watch EastEnders on Christmas Day and um, and have some of this gear. And chocolate's brilliant. Who doesn't like chocolate? I mean, well, do you know one of my big bugbears about boozers is the fact that, um, and restaurants, in fact, is that you can't just get a nice bit of chocolate after mm-hmm. a meal. Sometimes I'm, I don't want a whole pudding, but I want a, a, a rum or a whiskey after the meal. And I just want a little piece of chocolate. It's the... Or bit. maybe a chocolate bar, or such as something. Well, this is where you, or maybe I'd like a, an, an entire entire grab box bag of chocolate. Yeah. Box of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> That's where well, you I start mean, to come off the rails a bit, Ben. But yeah, I agree. Just a small amount of really good, high quality chocolate next yeah. to something like a Diplomatico. That is, it, it. It it satisfies now as I get older that demand for something sweet at the end of something savoury. It's a treat. Really I deserve needs. it. Uh, but I my palate expects I want it them. as well. But also, I just want to have a nut. Yeah, it would. If you saw a menu, uh, diplomatico rum, you go, oh, yeah, that'd be nice. Hmm. But if they said we're serving diplomatico rum with some very, very artisan chocolate, hmm. you'd go, oh, I'll have that as well, and I'll probably pay instead of paying nine, ten quid, I'll pay ten, oh, twelve quid. Yeah, or something like that. Upsell. That's but, called um, an upsell. It's not about margins. It's upselling. Anyway, any any publicans or restaurateurs, you can have that for free. Yeah, they'll need it. Fuck knows, they'll need it. Uh, <laughs> harsh times, man. Stop. Come on, go to your local when they're open again. Please, yeah. please, people. Support Just go, your local. Go and buy booze from them. Beer, yeah. anything. Just anything. go to them. Just go and Not sit in there and, and make them feel better. Um, anyway, what chocolate have you got? Well, I've got lots of different chocolates, but I was going to give the the, the pod pod bods a little bit of a chocolate background. It's nice to go on. for us when sometimes we go into a different subject matter that isn't spirits, beer, or yeah. wine, which we're experts on, yeah, um, yeah. and we end up talking about something like chocolate. Right. So on, I, I just get to do some reading about something I didn't know much about. So these yeah. guys behind us are the Mayans, and in Mayan Crazy times, guys. the cocoa bean was used as currency, so it was considered by them to be worth more than gold dust, which does make sense if you think about it in terms of a precious metal what can you actually do with that whereas with the cocoa cocoa dust you can eat it so yeah. it does bring some genuine joy and uh they their cultivation was of the beans was actually restricted in the early civilizations uh so the value of the cocoa bean would go up or down a bit like an olden day stock market i suppose um mm. which is quite so, get, all the way back mar- there so, the chalk market the chalk market very good ben i can't well, believe done. that didn't just come to me you can have that. earlier uh the first chocolate bar that we know of was produced at this place fries of bristol in 1847 and i i put the fries of uh, for those who can see our video the fries factory up because it really does look a bit like roald dahl's um chocolate factory doesn't it willy wonka's willy wonka um, and their first chocolate bar that was ever retailing then was called the fries chocolate cream see, my my mum loved well, still do, does. She used to always have fries, chocolate cream, or some of their other variants in her handbag when I was little. Really? Yeah. It's, it's a, not. A, it's not a bar I'm particularly familiar with. I'll be oh, honest. It's lovely. They used to have one called Fries Five Centers, and each mm. uh, each chunk had a different f- um, fruity fondant filling. Okay. Uh, 
uh, it was a bit like, and it that was the same time. Honestly, I don't want to get all retro. Do you remember when? But that they used to, I used to have that, and you'd have Quattro. Yes, it? I don't remember Quattro, of course. Yeah, swimming yeah. pool, a swimming yeah. pool standard. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Well, in 1912, the big one was the Goo Goo Cluster, which is the first mass-produced cocktail, uh, cocktail combination yeah. bar. So that would be a precursor to the things you're talking about. But the it had marsh, oh, marshmallow, thing. nougat, caramel, and roasted peanuts. Um, but also uh, chocolate, like like alcohol, as we've you know, you've got the picture there behind you of the yeah. World War One soldiers who were sent chocolate on the front line to boost morale like alcohol yeah. chocolate has been used uh, and the military still have it as in, in the us the military still have it as part of a, their their ration uh, which started in 1937 and they still give troops in the basic field ration uh, their sundry packs they still get chocolate That's pretty cool so do they is... give a hershey bar because remember in empire of the sun Mm. Where um, who's the guy? Who's the kid who played? Um, Christian Bale played the kid. Christian didn't Bale he? wasn't. Didn't Malkovich? Was Malkovich in that? Yeah, he goes. Yeah, do, so, yeah. do you want a Hershey bar, kid? Yeah, was yeah. a big. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. They probably still do. It's their big brand, isn't it? A bit like our dairy I milk. Don't, I don't like the Hershey. I don't like Hershey. No. They can't do chocolate, the Americans. No. Oh, or oh, it turns out elections. Anyway. Uh, this is a picture of Shackleton at the Antarctic in 1908 uh, because uh, he went with a supply of whiskey, which we've talked he about did. in our podcast and our shows before, and he went with some cocoa, cocoa, cocoa yeah. in a tin, uh, which was also found with the whiskey completely really? in, intact, in excellent, in excellent condition. It was described. Uh, some round trees powdered chocolate. So he also took actual coke as well as cocoa. He took coke, didn't he? Frozen mm. March. They thought it would cure snow blindness. Um, Did they though? <laughs> I don't know. It's a very good excuse. But imagine <laughs> stuck in a hut. No, dear. Oh, I'm taking mean. it because it cures snow blindness, right? Yeah. Every twelve explorers in a freezing cold hut, all doing Chang and whiskey. <laughs> what do you do when you've done Chang in the Arctic? <laughs> <laughs> Right, lads. Let's talk uh, to each other. Go talk over each other. This is awesome. hell. <laughs> I've got nowhere to go and the same people to talk to. Oh, horrific. Although maybe without without cocaine, you'd be in even worse trouble. Yeah. Um, don't do that, drugs. Drugs are for mugs. We don't drugs do drugs. We drink. Do that's drugs. that's yeah. our yeah, drug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also chocolate today, because it is a bit, yeah. a bit of a drug. Yeah. Um, so Joseph Roundtree, and interesting on this fact, Joseph Roundtree was the man who created the Roundtree chocolates, but he was a Quaker, and he actually frowned on the abundance of alcohol. He oh, was yeah. part... So he promoted chocolate drinks as an alternative to, to not the alcohol. They're not, not the same. same. But Joseph. have this Joseph... We know he wasn't a teetotaler because it turned out uh, there was a list that emerged years later that, that proved he was actually buying wine, beer, and he, in 1874, purchased a dozen bottles of champagne. So, Joseph what a hypocrite. Mm. Mm. Anyway, the um, next pitch you've got, I like the look of, what's that? Is this, uh, oh yeah. Well, this comes into the recent study on chocolate, which brings us to the modern yeah. age. A study of 2,000 adults found the average person would also indulge themselves in 3,024 mugs of hot chocolate, 126 Easter eggs, and feast on 2,898 miniature chocolate bars over the course of their life. This was actually part of a poll that was right. led by, believe it or not, Who? the British Heart Foundation. <laughs> They ran a poll. Now, I assume it was to uh, draw attention to the fact that chocolate is bad for you. And it, and it should be said that uh, chocolate can be bad for you. It contains the theobromine, uh, which can be uh, the cause of heart failure. Theobromine poisoning can lead to heart failure, seizures, acute kidney damage, damage and dehydration. And to ingest, yeah, to ingest enough theobromine for it to be fatal, though, you'd have to eat 22 pounds so Americans for you, or in our parlance, 40 bars of chocolate in one sitting. Ben? <laughs> I've come close. I've come close, but <laughs> but I know. Well, well, I think no I, um, <laughs> no, I've come close, but I haven't. I think the those figures are um they've over they've over factored the um the, the hot chocolate. 
There's no way I've drink that much hot chocolate. No, it's a funny one, isn't it? Although the I'll kids definitely are starting more to get into chocolate, it. normal chocolate, but the mm. hot chocolate. I mean, I mean, how many? When's the last time you had a cup of hot chocolate? Three thousand and twenty-four mugs over the course no of your way. life. No way. And that's the average person. I mean, I'm a I'm above average. So yeah, um, there's and everything no else I do. So that means yeah, I'm drinking more. Yeah, wine writing. Wine writing, particularly. <laughs> Hush tag. Wine writing is well easy. <laughs> Wine writing is well easy. <laughs> anyway, right that home, was kids. so. So the poll of the British Heart Foundation put into order the top twenty bars that are purchased in the United Kingdom. And would you like to hear this list, Ben? I think yes, you would. I do. What do you think was uh, number one? What do you think was number one? As I've not shown in the UK. You. In the UK, the number one so Mars bar. No, nope. I'll give you three guesses. Do them quick. Um, uh, Twix. No. Nope. Snickers. Snickers! Really? Whoa. Snickers was number Pulled one. Out. Well done. Well done. Uh, dairy Milk was number two. Galaxy Bar three. Number four, Bounty. Really? Gal- Galaxy Bar was... Well, it's going to get more. It's going to get more stunning. Bounty was number four. Oh, no, no. That polarises opinion. Very bounty. Much Can you imagine that being an... I don't mind a Bounty. Um, mm. I've got one here. Where is it, Ben? It's on your head. I put a bun- you put a Bounty on your head. Very good. <laughs> Do you remember we did that one with Kofi Annan? Yeah. And then he died. <laughs> There's no more bounty on his head. Um, unless he was buried with one. Who knows? Good Number enough. five. Big... <laughs> <laughs> number five was a Kit Kat. Classic. Yeah. That that was above number six, Twix. Hmm. Seven was a twirl. When was the last time you bought a twirl? I bought I got, I went big on twirls when they first came out when I was a teenager. Hmm. Um, but they, they, I think they cannibalized some of Twix's sales, maybe. Well, they're a bit like a flake, aren't they? But with a wrapping, like a chocolate wrapping. They are very much like a, I think that's what they are. Yeah. Uh, a flake rolled in chocolate. Eight was a whisper. Say that again. Whisper. (laughs) Nine, everyone's favorite, Mars Bar. Oh, I see. See, uh, no, I, I, I'm not a fan of Mars bars. No, I've gone off them. I liked them when I was a kid, but uh, I quite like them out of the freezer, out of the fridge. You know, when the the, the soft centres mm. a bit harder. Anyway, number ten was a flake, which is the picture behind us for those. Who yeah, there's, see a, there's a. Do you remember? I used, there's an app uh, for anyone who's who's listened to this purely uh, with their ears and not their eyes. Um, we've got a picture of the woman enjoying a flake. Enjoying. I'll be honest, in a very phallic, phallic fashion. I mean, she's uh, really from an advert when that. they're wearing that, where um, she's running a bath. And I remember even as a kid watching that going, just feeling really stressed out that all the water was overspilling. Mm. It's a bit like floor. if you do a poo in the bath, isn't it? It's the sort of mess it makes. No, no, very different. <laughs> very different. No, a water overflowing <laughs> it's out. It's like some sort of dirty very, protest. <laughs> very different. <laughs> Um, but the thing I have a problem with flakes is that if you eat a flake um, and a little bit of um, a little crumb of the flake falls onto your clothes, which it always does, mm. if you swipe it away, it always smudges. Mm. Uh, so to get it off without smudge or smear, you have to be like forensic, like a blow. safe like a, taking it off. Shake. And, um, Shake and blow. I, yes, that's mm. not bad. That's a solution for a, a lot I've... of problems. Um, so, uh, isn't that right, young lady eating your flake in the bath? <laughs> Just shake and blow. <laughs> so, that was uh, our flake, which was at number 10 on the list. Now, number 11 was a crunchy, number 12 was an aero mint, number 13 was a Kit Kat crunchy, uh, number 14, Toblerone. I could go on. Uh, one of the best chocolate bars here would be the number 15 which is a double decker we've got a double decker on the list here and i know ben you've got some uh, some info haven't you now about double deckers double decker is double decker one of your is the double decker one of your favorite ben is that fair to say the double decker you like the double decker um, yeah i do like the double decker sorry yeah, just all right. I just lost you there for a second. The lockdown worldwide web is uh, showing its true colours once again as everyone scuttles indoors and takes all all of the uh, 
all of the actual power out of the World Wide Web. But you've got a double decker there. Have you got one with you? I do. Sorry, can you hear me now? Because I can. Zoom. Yeah, that's just fine. Just, just, you, you, oh, sorry about. Did you keep it going? I did. Yeah, yeah. I just went through all the list, but number fifteen is a double decker. Right. So, so yes, I've got a double decker, and I'm going to taste the Mantuano with that. Are you? Okay. Because yeah. let me tell you about the double decker. My grandfather, wonderful, wonderful man called George, uh, he was a Welsh French fella, and he was into coupons. He loved a coupon. Always, always collecting coupons, and him and my, uh, uh, myself and my cousin, who's the same age as me, Jacques, who's chairman of Hampton Richmond Football Club, get down there support him. Anyway, he um, he collected double decker coupons, and one day came back with a suitcase, a briefcase rather, full of double deckers, and he opened them up like that scene in Pulp Fiction where it went. Mm. And I was very excited. And my cousin went, "I don't like double deckers." Um, <laughs> um, in fact, he, he, he was more of a Mars Bars man. Uh, and uh, I've always had a soft spot for them. Wow, they are them soft. They're yeah, and they, But they've also got a lovely sort of Rice crispy thing going on, hmm. which I think is so equal, it's perfect with the Mantuano. Mm. Well, it was number 15 on our on our list of actually, I think the, the list goes to, to 30. So let's come back to your Mantuano pairing, just quickly rattle off the rest. Because right, sure. after that was the... Cadbury's Fruit and Nut Milky Bar, which isn't real chocolate, apparently. It was 17. Uh, we've all been lied to on that one, apparently. In order to be classified as real chocolate, product has to contain cocoa solids or cocoa liqueur. White chocolate contains cocoa butter instead, so apparently it doesn't really fit in. 18 was Bourneville, which was my dad's. I always remember that. 19, Lindor. Not a chocolate bar, really, is it? Don't know why that's on no. the list. 20 was Fry's Turkish Delight, which is my mum's favourite, and I think is weird. Not a chocolate yeah. bar. Um, no. Number 20, now, uh, number 21, Dime Bar. <laughs> Armadillos. Armadillos. What a yes. great, great advertising campaign that was um, with Harry Enfield there. Um, yeah, you're not... a bit thick, aren't you? Remember that? <laughs> That's what can't say it. that anymore. Uh, 22, Cadbury's Caramel. 23, Ro Galaxy Ripple. This is getting boring now. Cadbury's, <laughs> Cadbury's Fudge was number 24. Finger of Fudge is just, just enough. enough. Give, a treat. Give yourself a treat. <laughs> I, I, weird, I can go. Uh, <laughs> Picnic, number 25. Picnic. No, where's what about topic? I would have put top. Right. Yeah, well, anyway, this is interesting. Look, this I, is I, getting... I thought the same. Star bar as well. Galaxy caramel. Aero number thirty was Yorkie. Obviously, the uh, Not best for ladies. The best chocolate bar. I've put I've put a note here, which is really shit. Listen to this. Obviously, the best bar to open your front door with, Ben. <laughs> your key. Your key. Oh Jesus! I could see that coming into the show. That's how desperate we'll get. We have to write oh, this in January. God. Um, no curly wordy, no car ca caramac, no caramac. Do you remember those in swimming pool machines? Caramac. Yeah, but no, that's probably that's probably that probably comes on the confectionery, doesn't it? I don't know if Dime Bar makes it in. Same sort of thing, isn't it? Chocolate coloured. Yeah, wasn't it true. chocolate covered? Maybe it I'm wasn't. I'm fine. The Aero, the Aero, the Aero's lowly position. Aero. Mm. Um, you so so we, we're onto the we're onto the tasting. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only taken us 45 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I have, uh, uh, it was very nice to see the Kit Kat placing in there. Interestingly, yeah. Mars went for an alternative to the Kit Kat, which they called Snick Snack, which is pretty, pretty cheeky. But they also called it a Sprint at one point. Uh, but my first chocolate bar is not a Sprint. It's a marathon. <laughs> yes, it certainly is. Uh, it really was a marathon getting to this point. Now, some of you will know this is the Snickers bar. Uh, it's marathon to us. They renamed it in 1990. Recently, they had a campaign, actually, to uh, put marathons back on shelves for the 30th anniversary. And um, they put them on with their, with their real name, Ben. So you might see some of those in Martin McColls and other news agents. Um, and what I liked about the Snickers is the caramel, the peanuts. Um, and these are some of the flavor profiles you get in your Mantuano. So um, yeah. as we said, this is a column still rum with batch kettle and pot still rums all blended together, made molasses, sugar cane, Asian American oak. So as Ben was saying earlier, you get a lot of vanilla on the nose. Um, also get some mm. um, 
some a uh, slight cherry, maybe cinnamon in mm. there, Ben. You get any cinnamon? Slight whiny yeah. note. Slight whiny note as well. Um, for all you wine well, experts well, you know. there, like us. Um, it's uh, it it's it smells like it's going to be it's got a bit of bruised banana in there, Tom. Yeah. Okay. I like that. It smells like it's going to be quite sweet, and then you taste it. Mm. Oh. And it is sweet, but it's quite. It's quite light. It's not. It's not like a rich, chocolatey sweetness. It's sort of got a bit of uh, acidity. Is the wrong word because it's still quite rich. It's got well, a kind of um, you know the caramel you get in a Twix. Yes, or indeed a Snickers. Not, the, not yes, but not the Mars bar. The Mars bar caramel is considerably heavier, in my view. And I, I you can see the legs on the on the yeah. spirit as they come down the side of the glass we talk about legs sorry my glass looks like it should have had a polish and also it's a whiskey glass that one um it's uh if you can see that on the on the on the screen the legs are the trail that the spirit leaves down the side of the glass and the speed at which the legs flow down the side of the glass uh, determines um potentially how much alcohol there is in there but also the level of oak extraction uh, there's there is going on so the, the slower it takes the more you can tell it's taken some of those oak components mm. into the spirit and it tastes like a raisiny there's the vanilla in there there's the cinnamon i was talking about it's a um, very um very good bridge between sort of mixing rums and, and and sipping rums isn't it it's got that lovely um lightness to it mm. that you could imagine using that in a highball or a yes. Um, it's 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 a perfect versatility. It's got a lot of versatility, Tom. It has. Um, um, I like it, and it goes. It does go with the Snickers. But let's be honest: if you're treating yourself at Christmas to a to a luxury, well, ride, you've got to go posh. Um, and so I think there. we should do. A, um, I've done posh and, uh, for want of a better word, pauper. Yes, peasant chocolate peasant. Yeah. Mm. What have you got, man? Uh, you because you talked about your, but we don't really. I, I uh, mean, double that, decker. I was just doing that for my uh, for my my late grandfather. He was a lovely man, mm. um, and I always feel bad that our reaction to his double decker stash was underwhelming. He looked so gutted, and as a father now, I realise how you feel when you think you're going to give your kids something really cool and they're, they're a bit bothered. It's pretty gutting. Anyway, um, I eat a lot of them just for him but i'm going for um so i've gone for three um post chocolates for, to go with each rum from one um uh from one producer and that right. producer is um very artisan or uh, very very artisan and very uh, uh it's doing very good things they're called harry specters and they're based in cambridge you know a social enterprise set up by a, a couple mona and shaz and their son ash who is autistic, um, and as well as making some amazing chocolate, which, and it is amazing, they also do really good stuff. They create employment and, and work experience for, for young autistic people. Mm. Um, and so they, um, the autistic employees and, and work experience people they get in, they get involved in, 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 it's not just a token thing, they get involved in all aspects of the business from the packaging design to making the chocolates. And it's, the whole thing is designed to give give these autistic people confidence, improve their employability. And um, they work with lots of local um, special needs schools and organizations, and they raise awareness of, of autism employment among other businesses locally and nationally. Uh, and this is a big thing. I mean, uh, lots of autism, there's lots of child, uh, young people who have various uh, degrees of autism um, and they are perfectly capable of living very good lives and being employed in, in enterprises that where their skills are, are, are very valued. So um, they've been doing this since 2015 and they've improved the lives and, 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 and confidence of, of more than 500 people uh, with autism. And they've, you know, they work with their carers and everything. And so it's, it's really, really good uh, what they're doing. Um, and, and what's brilliant about it, and I think what's crucial and whenever they have some of these social enterprises is that, the, the thing that the company, the thing that they produce or, or they make, or that the whole idea of the business needs to stand up on its own, regardless of, of whether they're doing good things elsewhere. And this does. This chocolate is amazing. Right. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, Tom. 
if this company was selling asbestos to orphans, I'd still eat it. It's absolutely brilliant. The fact yeah, they're doing okay. some wonderful things with young autistic people is is great. But the chocolate is wonderful. And with the Mantuano, um, I'm going for uh, the, just I'm going to go for the hazelnut because I think there's a nutty definitely element to it. Definitely, I think um, that's that's uh, and that is one of those flavor profiles that I've picked up on. Um, yeah. And I'm really good stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, like you, went and did some posh chocolate buying uh, and I picked up the, um, I went into Waitrose because Waitrose uh, sells our Diplomatico rums, yeah. but also sells fancy chocolate for posh people. It does. And they've got their own brand of single origin chocolate. And actually that's one of the, one of the, recommendations from Diplomatico themselves has suggested some of these uh, Waitrose chocolates and they've got a whole they've got a whole range of uh, of posh posh That's chocolate meat. so I, I'm actually going to go with the a single origin Dominican Republic which is 65% cocoa on this one um, but I'm going to come back to that because I might use that I'm going to I think I'm going to use that again and um, uh, what, well, it's worth saying when you take this out of the pot Pack it. Look at that. It's like oh. a gold wrapper. It does actually it's feel like Willy really Wonka's. Like, it does. Willy Wonka's ticket. It does. It feels like I'm, I'm going to get an invite to the Dominican Republic. No, no, I'm not. Not um, at the moment. Dark oh, chocolate. Good crunch. Good crunch there. It, is. it hasn't even been in the fridge. Let's have a look. Oh, let's see what my uh, mine's got soft, uh, soft interior. I'm really low. Like you, Ben. Hard exterior, but soft on the inside. Yeah. Um. I think my exterior is getting softer. The more mm. I eat this chocolate. Mm. Oh, nice. Beautiful stuff. Oh my God, okay. Right, yeah. we should probably say something rather than just eat chocolate. Um, but it's really nice. And that's what you should be pairing. <laughs> you should be pairing that. Um, uh, the single origin chocolate, just for those who don't know what that means, is just that it's been made from one variety of cacao, which you can see behind me uh, yeah. i always think it's strange to see what chocolate looks like before it becomes chocolate if you can see the video it's a big orange almost like a skinny pumpkin actually isn't it um and mm. uh, the beans inside it have characteristics a bit like terroir a bit like wine ben with your grapes uh, yeah. the terroir effects, all about that <laughs> you do uh so my dominican republic is 65 percent of that uh and it's it's a big part of what these countries are doing so people like waitrose are going directly to the small farm producers and supporting the smaller economies. So that's good. They're doing good stuff as well at Waitrose. And uh, so we're eating chocolate that makes us feel good and makes yeah. other people feel good. Here's What's the next then? Should we move well, on? We're going to reserve our... exclusiva and the chocolate. So so with when when pairing chocolate with this, you've got to consider the fact that it's it's a it's bigger than a Mantuano in terms of its character, it's more complex potentially. Uh, it's, Got some of the flavors in there. Like you've, got, you've got a bit of fruit cake, autumnal fruits, a bit of rum and raisin, you know, like the Ben and Jerry's rum and raisin ice cream. Mm. You get a bit of that cocoa. Um, there's a tiny touch of ginger in there. Um, we found, I mean, we know this because I mean, we, we I've got to say, we have drunk a lot of this. Um, um and go back to my bananas. I like a uh, I remember Oz Clark talking, uh, that he's a wine writer, it's similar status to us. Um, who once described a red wine as uh, bruised bananas in a in a leather satchel, and I okay. thought, so that's nice. not one of the flavour profiles here. But you've got baked bananas with fudge sauce. That's what uh, we've gone for. Mm. Um, bit of toffee. There's, if I was to say, nutmeg. Do you know? Um, yeah, that, yeah, I that know kind of, but not about. that sort of overwhelming. Nutmeg can be quite overwhelming, but it's, it's the nut, the sort of flavor you get when nutmeg is used. Um, and then you've got walnuts, hazelnuts, nuts. Essentially, I'd go, uh, I'd go generic there. It's mm. nutty, but it's it's really really lovely. And in terms of chocolate, I'm I'm going to go. Should I go for my peasant one first? Do them both, mate. I see. Them both. Peasant one first. Got to go for it. My favorite. Uh, minstrels. Oh, right. I know you love those minstrels. But you know what? My Touring for 10 years has made me yeah. very familiar with your affection. I love a minstrel. Minstrels. 
Um, my friends at school used to say that if I got grumpy or moody, they used to say I had pre-menstrual tension because I hadn't eaten enough of the minstrels. <laughs> Not something clever. to joke about, the girls, is it? Come no, on. no, no, no. Um, I feel the pain, sisters. <clears throat> um, it's, but they are so nice. Mm. They don't melt. You can crunch into them without... If I take the shell off with your teeth, that's a fun game to have. Mm. Um, I used to buy a family bag of these, plus a super can of Coke on the way back to school, and then watch Neighbours. It and was great the, days. And then go to the dentist. <laughs> and, and then, yeah. And then... Billings! Uh, and then off, <laughs> offered my diabetes check. Um, uh, um, yeah, you do eat them like Smarties, as we were discussing earlier. Um, yeah. They're like they're Smarties, they're like, but they're, they're Smarties. massive. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think if you let the, if you let the rum breathe... Uh, and then have a bit of, a, uh, and then warm these minstrels up in the palm so mm. they become a little softer. Mm. It is absolutely amazing. But bear in mind, I'd eat minstrels with anything. Um, so it's probably not a fair, a fair match. So I'm going to go for something even better. And that's my dark orange, um, my dark orange Harry Spectres. Uh, which is like a thinking, a thinking eaters, thinking drinkers, um, normal chocolate orange. Um, and it's apps. This is my favorite. Six percent, it's really soft in the middle, and the orange. Oh my god, it's so good! It is so good, and it really goes, it's got a caramel taste to it, which really goes with the sweet caramel in the rum. So, that is what I would go for. I, I'm, I'm my cho- chocolate orange. What have you gone for? I have gone for <clears throat> two things. Um, mm-hmm. I've gone for a Twix. Well, actually, what I was going to do was I was going to go for a Twix first off. Um, and, I just say I'm really enjoying this. Yeah, this is one of the best. I eat chocolate and drink and rum. One of the best tastings really, we've it? ever done. Oh, I imagine. Um, uh, my uh, my video's frozen there, folks. If you can't see me me yeah. tasting my Twix, I was going to go with the Twix, and then um, I t- tried for the Snickers again. I and mean, it's worth saying I've got a box of celebrations in front of me, and um, oh, I've put my Twix in my Snickers, my Snickers in my Twix packet there, Ben. I've got oh, my God. I've got my All Snickers. I've got my Snickers in a Twix. <laughs> <laughs> And other very good, very puns. good film. Yeah, I was going to get a whisper. I was going to get a whisper, uh, but oh. I seem to have lost that careless whisper. Must be George Michael's. Care. Yeah. <laughs> well, that one. You can have that one. Chocolate would, orange. I, mm. Okay, we've got so, a chocolate orange. I was going to do a chocolate orange, and um, and I do think uh, as of my video completely disappears. <laughs> Keep going. I, I do think the um, the Terry's Chocolate Orange is a good mix with the Reserva Exclusiva. Uh, yeah. And my wife loves Terry's Chocolate Orange. Claire is a big fan of these. And I do think it's worth saying at Christmas, you're probably going to pick up some of those traditional chocolates that you and the whole family like. So if you end up with a, uh, a Terry's Chocolate Orange, that's not a bad match at all. Uh, we're no. talking peasants versus posh, paupers versus posh. It might be regarded as the peasants version, but actually... It's a, it's 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 all right. That that does work. But if you do want to keep it posh, go back to the Waitrose selection, and um, they have got a single origin uh, orange and almond, uh, which is uh, a fantastic, um, fantastic chocolate bar, and um, uh, it's Ecuadorian and it's sixty percent um, cocoa, so it's it's got its single origin status. It's got orange and almonds in there as well. Um, Ecuador, just as an aside, produces 4% of the world production of cocoa. So um, it's it's good gear. But they're also responsible mm. for 70% of the upper class cocoa that we eat. So Waitrose, oh. is, uh, Waitrose has gone, gone yeah. for a good one there. I know their market. They, know they do. Market. Um, but it goes back to that with the Reserva Exclusiva, that slightly orangey note that it does have. It has that kind of fine citrus edge to it, which mm, when you pair it with an orange chocolate. Oh, it's so so good. I, I really, really, I mean, honestly, I don't, 
I, you hear about pairings and quite often you go, yeah, yeah, whatever. If you like, if you like the, if you like the drink and you like the food and put them together, it's sell, it's rare that you think, well, that's not a particularly nice experience. But when you add some two things together and that, and the combination of the two is greater than the parts, that's when you're on to a winner. And with this, I think it, the chocolate orange and the Diplomatica Reserva Exclusiva is genuinely something that works. It is. Um, Good. Well, I'm glad we agree, Tom. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to say that my video has completely stopped now. So uh, did mine, but I, we can hear you. And, and I'm we'll, keep it, we'll keep it going with the podcast. So just uh, go and tune into the podcast, folks. Um, yeah. I've worked out what I can it still is. See you. I can still see you, but you're just uh, static. Oh, I've got nothing on my screen. But there we go. Uh, That's all right. Where are you going? Well, we're going to go um, to the last. We're going to go to the last. Uh, familia Celestion. The last Celestion one, de now. Familia. So this is, this is, I mean, this is a good, this is a good gear this now for us. Uh, £54.95 a bottle of this will cost from the Whiskey Exchange. Worth getting involved in. Especially if you've, if you've got... Yeah, a bar Uh huh. If you've if you've got into the Reserva Exclusiva, go into this. Now, this is going to be slightly drier rum, a bit more yeah. complex than the Diplomatico Reserva Exclusiva. It's forty three percent ABV, so it has got a bit more intensity in its flavour. Um, it's still got the Reserva Exclusiva Diplomatico uh, the sort of signature smoothness they talk about. So something that runs through all their rums, and it was launched this year to to really deal with the people who wanted a, a step up from it, who still like their reserve exclusive in the drinks cabinet but also want to mm. explore a bit in a different direction so this rum is slightly different on the nose and if you have it in front of you now you can yeah. smell it and it's got a guy it's got a lot more of the orange oh, in there, actually yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah it's got um it's kind of like a fruity fruity jelly sort of orange um but the peel as well quite zesty oh. uh, and then there's a caramel uh it's slightly lighter it's got Oh, it's got some um, definitely caramel, some sort of barley caramelly sort of smells in there. I'm going to taste it. Mm. Boom. Bo bo um, yeah, that's Oh, big. God, that's good. That's big. But there's the spice in there. And uh, slight, uh, up, up in the ante slightly in the alcohol heat. It's got coffee. So it's, it's got very nice. got that. Mm. You know, you get that berry like flavor you'd in, you know, you have like a proper hipster coffee. Yeah. It costs like 15 pounds. Yeah. A, a, a mug. Um, you get that lovely berry like fruit flavor. It's yeah. Tasty. A bit of that in there as well. It's brilliant. It's really, really good rum for sipping neat. And we'll go back. We'll probably go back to the Dominican Republic for my pairing there, Ben. I'm not. I, I I'd say much as I love our our sort of our celebrations and Terry. Yeah, I, I, I don't, don't think this is really one for mucking about with at all. No, no, no. Um, Come on. So I'll go back to my uh, my. Well, for sixty five percent, the Dominican Republic uh, gear. You see, Dominican Republic, a really great chocolate producer, one hundred fifty thousand hectares planted with cocoa uh, by forty thousand different producers. So. Um, and, and Waitrose obviously deals with a lot of those those smaller guys and gets it direct from source. But they also, I'm going to up the ante because the 65% wow. actually, I was talking to the guys from Diplomatico and they said that's a really good one, the Waitrose. But if you go to the 90%, oh, the 90% right. is a bit more bitter. It's got a lot of those stronger sort of coca notes. It's quite... It's quite challenging for some people if they like this. It's not cooking chocolate. chocolate, is it? It's not. It's still, it's still the single origin. Um, Do you ever, if if you're looking for chocolate in the house and you haven't got any, but you're really craving it, would you ever stoop to a, uh, yes. a cooking chocolate? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. More. I did did it this last week. We were doing um, yeah. rice Christmas rice crispy cakes with the chocolate, and it was the only chocolate in the fridge. And I I picked it up and said to my wife, yeah. "Can I? Can I have this, please?" And she she vetoed it because it was for the kids. Were you? She didn't let you out your cage. Yes. <laughs> Please, can I have some? I have some of this cooking chocolate. Don't hit me. She put me under the stairs. Oh, you cannot, you naughty little boy. You think you're, <laughs> you think you're a wizard? Um, which is a Harry Potter reference. For anyone who's read Harry Potter. Great books. Uh, great books. chocolate, and it really that. When it comes to Diplomatico, you should be you should be using luxury chocolate across the board. And when it gets to, gets yeah. to that end, right. that, uh, that bitterness actually brings out a lot of the sweetness 
in the rum itself. So it's yeah. uh, oh, gorgeous, gorgeous. Well, I um, I've gone for their their classic Harry Specter's dark classic slab. They call uh, it, and I like that because okay. it's just like not much about. Yeah, a sixty percent dark chocolate with, and they've got roasted cocoa nibs in there, and they've also got a bit of vanilla. A cocoa nibs, things. like is that extra chocolate in chocolate? Just they, they've, they've, chocolate they've, chip they've chocolate. done sixty percent chocolate and thought, hang on, there's not enough chocolate <laughs> in this chocolate. <laughs> put some more in. I right, let's put some more in, and they put in. So they've got they've also the cocoa butter, but it's it's really, really intense. Mm. But the nibs, the texture of it, just oh, it's really good gear. Yeah. And then with the with the um, selection de famille, um, yeah. it's really the the vanilla sort of dovetails. Good word there, dovetails with the um, the vanillins from the oak. So I think it's a really good pairing. And after this is we've pressed stop on the record, I'm going to keep doing this because it's Friday and it's locked down, <laughs> and I'm going to sit there. I might make a fire. And just stare into my my wood burning stove, middle yeah. class, and just keep doing this because it is one of the most pleasurable pairings of food and drink I've ever had. Yeah. I don't mind telling you. It's and I'm it's helping good. people. You're helping. You're helping people. We're helping uh, communities in uh, no. in developing Venezuela. countries. We're no. helping autistic people. No. We're, we're helping Venezuelans by drinking no. their product. Um, drinking their rum, we are just. I'm going to be. A, I'm soon to be a burden on the NHS because I'm essentially <laughs> self harming with rum and chocolate. But now's not the time, mate. Now's not the time. <laughs> it's not. Give them some breathing space. I clap for them. The least they can do is sort me out. Ah, <laughs> uh, there we go. Uh, the 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 images we've been putting up on our our video have finally crashed you as well. Yeah. Uh, it turns out we just, we've been drinking too much. <laughs> the video yeah. element of our podcast is coming, crashing down around. Well, I mean, room. I'm just looking around my, the, my desk. I have got three bottles of rum, <laughs> two bowls of crickets, a pouch of wine, a hobgoblin beer, and lots of chocolate. And a glass of water, which I should probably... I'm going to throw some cognac into that mix as well as mm. a box of celebrations. And hasn't it been a celebration? Uh, that and also, is... I've, there's one last thing I've got is my three uh, gold tankers for my British Guild of Beer Writing, Beer Writer of the Year Awards. Ah, and in a distance, I can see my beautiful um, decanter from the IWSC for winning yeah. spirits communication no, of the year. Not two people you punch down to. Not really, is it? Your um, bell end. Right. <sighs> anyway, so that's that. And that brings us to the end of our fantastic series on rum, which I think we have delved into every element of it, the history, mm. the cocktails, the neat sipping with chocolate. Uh, we told you everything you need to know. If you didn't, if this is your first time you dipped into this, go back and listen to episodes one and dipped two. We'll into you a, yeah, I dip, yeah. yeah, go back to uh, the chronology and the history behind it. Um, a massive thank you to Diplomatico who sent us all yeah. this rum. We can tell you to go out and buy it. They did send us some of this. Although I have bought some, they have actually sent us some free rum. So that was very good of them. Uh, they are, they are. We're going to keep banging on about how good they are. They are a good, good crowd. They're 100 family owned Venezuelan company. Uh, Venezuela has a lot of challenges at the moment, so do go and support their mm -hmm. economy by buying some of their rum. And it is an independent family owned company, family owned company. So that's that's quite a good thing as well, isn't it? And they also support their local communities. We should say they they actually uh, provide jobs and works for. For, for people in Venezuela who, are, who at the moment really need it. They care about their planets, our planets as well. They do a lot for the sugar industry, uh, sugar development, science, farming. Uh, in fact, Ben, there's a new new strain of sugar called Diplomatico. Diplomatica. Diplomatica. Uh, a new variety of sugar cane uh, because of the 10 years of working with researchers and science that, that they've they've been involved in to help sugar that's amazing it's like finding a new color yeah uh, so that's pretty cool uh so they're a great company and they've been great rum so thank you very much for for getting involved but i think that's probably it for a while i think isn't it? i think we've probably we were saying this was going to be a short one it hasn't but anyway yeah. i think um size matters it's good well done we're going to be going away for a couple of weeks now, aren't we, Ben? Because we, yeah, we have to, to write have a to book. finish our book. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, that is a priority for us, pod bods. So if you've been enjoying these pods, please sh- tell everyone. There's plenty of content for people to go back and yeah. listen to if they haven't heard of us before. Uh, go spread the news. Spread Don't the news. spread the virus. Mm. Um, but we will be away for a few weeks now, so we will. Don't worry. Get on all the socials and tell you when we're back and live with our next podcast. And also, we are coming back. There will be some theatre dates. Believe it or not, we're going to be back in theatres a lot sooner than you think. And funny enough, a lot sooner than we thought. So we've also, as well as writing a book, we've got to write a show. So um, uh, the pods won't be going out with quite the irregularity that it has done. But don't worry, this is not the end. It's the beginning of a new chapter. Indeed. Okay. Thanks for listening, everybody. We love you guys. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm just going to stop. Press stop. Yeah.